Welcome to the Global Investor Podcast, a show that focuses on helping foreign investors enter the lucrative U.S. real estate market. Host Charles Carrillo combines decades of real estate investing experience with a professional background in international banking to interview experts in all areas of U.S. real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Charles Carrillo. Welcome to another episode of the Global Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Crillo. Today we have Anthony Metzger. Anthony is an up and comer in the real estate syndication space. He closed on his first complex alongside a private equity firm in 2019. It was a 218 unit complex. He has since then house hacked a four plex while continuing to underwrite potential deals for syndication. So thank you so much for being on the show. Charles, it's a pleasure to be on the show and thank you for having me. Yeah, sure, sure. I always like to talk to investors and uh, especially investors that uh, closed over 200 units on their first deal. So give us a little background on yourself, both uh, personally and professionally before getting involved in real estate investing. Sure. So I'm from Minnesota and right out of high school, I got involved in the wine industry. So I went over to Europe right after high school at the age of, I think I was 18, turning 19. Um, became a sommelier. Then I, I shifted into winemaking, traveled to different countries to make wine. Um, and so really my 20s, I went to Napa Valley College out in California for three years. So really my 20s was in the wine industry and coming home from the wine industry, um, all my travels, it was a great time, traveled a lot, met a lot of great people, did a lot of cool things. But then all of a sudden after, after so much of that, you know, I was ready to kind of move on to something that's more entrepreneurial because I've always wanted, you know, I've always had that drive in me to, to be an entrepreneur and I've always really wanted to be really rich. So I didn't see a, a pathway forward in the wine industry. I know there's, there's a lot of rich people in the wine industry, but for me at the time, I, nothing was clicking. So what I did is I started listening to a podcast, real estate investing podcasts, specifically regarding syndications. And um, that's how I initially got started and interested in, in real estate. Nice, nice. Yeah, the wine industry is a great place to find investors, I imagine, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, no, it's, uh, it's nice because like if I, when I come across a potential investor nowadays, hey, you want to go grab a glass of wine and, <laughs> you know, and, and talk about, talk about uh, real estate investing. So nice. Yeah. yeah. I, I, Right. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, every time out in Napa and Sonoma, uh, it's just like a lot of dumb money around those industries. So that's, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, people, love, people love spending the money on the wine. So that's good. <laughs> so other than being rich and uh, was there anything else that why you chose real estate as your investment vehicle? I mean, uh, I mean, freedom, obviously being wealthy. These are all things that come from, but was there anything else that's kind of like what your why is? Once I started looking into real estate and, and studying it, it's one of those industries that, you know, for me, I, I'm, I'm like a C student. I never really did great in school. I wasn't an A student and didn't, didn't go to the big universities, but looking at real estate, it's, it's an industry for me that's um, simple, not easy, but simple to understand and wrap my head around. And, you know, I know, I knew while looking at it, that if I put in the work, if I put in the grind, I put in the time that, there is a pathway, a proven pathway to success in this industry. So it really clicked with me in, in that sense where I was able to wrap my head around it. You know, hey, you buy this building, you collect rents, it cash flows. Um, and then obviously it gets a little more complex when you start talking about syndications, but there's just so much great information and content out there, like, like your podcast, where you can listen to it and get, get such great information from people that have done it. So you're, you're learning from real teachers when listening to podcasts like yours that I was able to get all of this information and it clicked with me, unlike, you know, school or it definitely didn't. So um, that's that's really why I, I went towards this industry is because it was something I could wrap my head around, understand. And I knew if I put in the time and the grind, I could I could um, find success. So. Yeah, it's uh, definitely an industry. It's not brain surgery. I mean, it's if you talk to anyone, no one ever is like, how does that, how do you make money renting real estate? You know what I mean? Right. Like everybody has rented an apartment before and they understand, ah, okay. They don't understand probably the spread on the back end to the real, to the landlord. Um, but the thing though is that, um, or, you know, the due diligence as it goes with it or everything else, but they understand that, you know, how money comes in and mm -hmm. where money goes, uh, which is a lot easier for a lot of, compared to a lot of different asset classes out there that um you know that people might not be as aware of of how you actually uh 
are able to monetize it. So that's uh, that's awesome. So right. let's talk about your first deal, 218 units. That's huge. How did you find this deal? So I found it by um, signing up on these different brokerage firms mailing list, which I'm pretty sure just about anyone can do. I'm talking about the big ones like Marcus Millichap, Newmark. You know, you can go to these guys' website, sign up for their, um, to join their mailing list. And then they just start email blasting um, deals out daily. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can look at my inbox if I got 10 today. So um, I signed up for that list. And then as deals started coming into my inbox, I would start analyzing them. And at first, you know, just getting started into this, into this um, underwriting business, I didn't really know what it was I was looking for. I knew exactly what I needed to find, but when a deal came across my desk, I would analyze it. And there was, there was a benefit to that. And that was to learn how to underwrite and sharpen my pencil. Um, but nowadays I can look at a deal and just by looking at the photos um, and some of the, some of the basic information, I can tell whether it's worth diving into or not. But going back to my deal, Yes, I, after, after just looking at, through all these different types of deals, this portfolio came across my inbox. And it was a two property portfolio of about, I'll say 350 units. And what I did is I dissected that portfolio. So I looked at each property separately. And when I did that, I realized one of the properties does not make any financial sense for us and for our investors, doesn't meet our returns or requirements. The other one did. So what we did, so what I did at that point is I reached out to the broker and started talking to them, tried to get a ballpark price of what it is they were looking for. Um, and once I knew I was in the ballpark, that's when I really decided to dive in deeper, meaning reaching out to different property management companies, um, doing a price per square foot analysis on my own with, um, mm -hmm. by finding comps on apartments.com. Um, so I really started diving into it. Once I felt very confident, maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but that's how I found the deal. Just, just signing up for these on these brokers lists and then just sort going through all, analyzing all these deals. And then I found this one in a portfolio. So really anybody can sign up for these lists, as you mentioned, and uh, I'm on a ton of them as well. I have a separate email address we have at our company where we get all this in and it just never ends. Right. Uh, I think I got three before I got on this call, <laughs> um, <clears throat> which is great because anybody listening here can sign up for them right now. Right. And within 24 hours, your email backs too can be filled with deals uh, with uh, thousands of other people. But how did you get the broker to take you seriously, which is really... I mean, let's be honest, that's what it is everywhere. These people are working on commission. And if we were in their position, the same thing is we want to vet our buyers, make sure that they're not, you know, full of hot air, let's just say for the show. Um, what, what, like, what did you do? How do you, how do you tell someone that you're real, you're going to close? And I imagine this is like a 10, $15 million deal. I mean, that's a lot of money for a new investor. I mean, what did you do to get them to take you seriously? Right. Yeah. So this, um, this deal was just over 11 million. And actually, so we've closed on it. It's been almost a couple of years now. And if you go to my website, financialbedrock.com, you can download the sample deal package on that deal that we closed on. I turned it into a sample deal package. Now that it's not an active um, deal. So anyone can go and look at it and see how we underwrite. But the way I got the broker to take me serious on this one, because like you said, I have, I have zero credibility. I mean, I don't have any, any <laughs> no offense. Any, sorry. Yeah, no, I got, I got, I had zero deals before this. I didn't even own a, a house. I was living in an apartment. So the way I had them take me serious was before getting on that phone call. So mind you, it was a year and a half of analyzing and looking for deals till I found mm -hmm. this one. And during that time period, I signed up for a course that educated me on how to underwrite deals and look for deals and analyze deals. And in that course, they teach you essentially the language of real estate. So, so I speak two languages fluently, French and English. And real estate investing is almost like its own language. So what I did is I learned that language. So when I get on the phone with, with these brokers, I can speak their language. And when you can get right on a phone call and right away start diving into the deal, mm -hmm. asking real questions, that, that shows that you're professional, you know what you're looking for, you know what you're talking about. And 
they tend to just start getting into the conversation. And in this case, it just right away, we just got into the conversation. It wasn't, well, who, who are you? What's, you know, what's going on here? It was like, you know, immediately getting into the conversation, asking the right questions, speaking the language. Then he starts replying and talking. And once we get past that initial conversation, you know, the first in quick introduction, at that point, we're talking about the deal. We're talking about the price. And um, it was as simple as that, getting educated, learning the language so that when I get on the phone with these, with these professionals, I can have that conversation. Nice. Yeah, it's awesome. So you were educated in your vocab. You knew what you were talking about. You had underwritten the deal. You're talking about debt, you know, all the different terms that we use in the commercial and the commercial multifamily space. Um, that's awesome. So the thing, though, is that there's really three parts of us. You, gotta, you have to find the deal, right? You have to find the money, and then you have to like do the asset management because really most people aren't going to be doing the management themselves when they're starting out. So they're going to have a property management company. They're going to be an asset management. So you partnered with a private equity firm. Um, how did you meet them? How did you meet this firm that was probably going to take care of a lot of the money raise and a lot of the asset management, I imagine? Right. So I was listening to a podcast one day and the person hosting the podcast was actually the founder of this of this mm. private equity group and they said loud loud and clear hey if you find a deal that meets our criteria we'll partner with you on it you know find it bring it to us and we'll partner with you on it and so i dove a little deeper into into that into what he said there went to their website found that they were selling a program that's the program i was mentioning that i got educated with um, bought their program got educated specifically on what it is they're looking for. And once I felt confident immediately, I started, I started going out and trying to find a deal for them. And um, so that's how I, I found them just by listening to podcasts. So I'll, I'll tell you too, I was, I was hosted on a podcast previously, probably a few months ago. And somebody heard me on that, was listening to the podcast and contacted me from, from me being on that podcast. And we, they called me, we started talking and, and they said, you know, I've got this deal <laughs> that that's uh, in the market that your deal is. And, and I brought it to this group and they didn't want to do it. And I said, well, send it over to me. Well, sure enough, he sent it over to me. We just made a full, we just made a full um, ask. We just sent it in an LOI to the, to the seller full asking price. So it's, it's, it's similar to that. It's, it's, I listened to a podcast, found somebody looking for a deal, found the deal, brought it to them. And then they decided to partner, partner with it, par partner with me on it. So, so that's, that's really how it worked out just by listening to podcasts and, and networking essentially. How did you, uh, how did you vet them? You know, li he had a ton of content out there, did mm -hmm. some research on, on, um, through his podcast, through, through social media, went to the website found that, you know, this, there's a lot of credibility. You really do get to know people by listening to their podcasts, by following their social media. I mean, also I didn't have much to lose. I mean, you know, I'm looking for a deal. It's not like I'm taking money and I'm giving it to somebody that, that I listened, that I heard one time. So without creating a relationship. So I felt confident in them. I looked at my option, you know, where I was at, I didn't have a whole lot to lose. Then I also started reaching out to them. I, I sent them an email, said, hey, the little introduction, just want to let you know, put myself on your radar that I am out looking for deals to bring to you. So they, you know, little, little introductions like that. Then he hosted a live event actually out in DC, which I attended. So that was also another way for me to get face to face mm -hmm. with them, shake his hand, talk to him, tell him about myself. So, you know, there's, there's ways you can, that's, yeah. So to answer your question, yeah. that's kind of how I've edited them. Yep. So you got educated and you did a ton of networking and that's uh, how this whole industry works right. because it's amazing how much relationships uh, kind of uh, matter when you're getting into these type of properties and these type of deals. So you mentioned before, I think when we were talking before I read about it was uh, you did some due diligence on the deal before because mm -hmm. just a, a side point here, like, you know, people will reach out to our firm and they'll send us deals and they won't be underwritten. And right. we're just like, well, you know, I'm like, that's not, <laughs> I'm not going to yeah. underwrite your deal so that you, you know what I mean? So right. I'm just like, Hey, just like, you know, that gets nixed. But the thing though, is that how much underwriting 
Like, you know, because that's going to show you how professional you are. Right. If you want me to review underwriting or someone on my firm to review underwriting, that's one thing. It's a different thing if like you just send me, hey, underwrite this and uh, I think we can get rents 20% higher. Yeah, you know? right. So how, what did you do? What was your preparation for that underwriting and due diligence prior to sending it over? Right. No, I, I did a lot. I mean, they, they, they asked that you do a lot, just like yourself. You know, you don't want somebody just forwarding you an email essentially and, and saying, like you said, oh, we could, this, this is a possibility. Well, did you dive into it at all? And, and the other thing is like bringing a deal to a sponsor like yourself or this group I was working with, um, you don't want to waste people's time. You know, time is very valuable, especially for people that are in the real estate industry that value, you know, that's one of the reasons why we get into this industry is because it allows us to, you know, freedom of time once we achieve a certain threshold of investing. But so you don't want to waste anyone's time. So what I did, and they, they told me this, did a ton of due diligence ahead of, ahead of time. So A, found, got the deal in my inbox. Then I underwrote it in our very, you know, complex Excel calculator. Then I talked to the broker, got some guide pro, um, price guidance. Then I did, um, what, so I, I looked, I went to apartments.com. I did my own rent comp analysis. Um, I looked at the financials. I looked at, oh yeah. So one of the things I did too, is I, I reached out to three different property management companies. Oh, nice. That, that I didn't have any previous relation with, relationship with. But, you know, reached out to them, tried to get some a performa, got a performa from two of them. Oh. Um, so I used that performa, put it into my model, looked at it compared to what they've got. So I did a, a lot of mm. due diligence. Essentially, I put the, the golf ball on the tee is the way mm. I like to say, because I even negotiated pricing. I got I got the pricing down to where to a ballpark of within a few hundred grand. And I knew at that point, all right. I've got a ton of um, due diligence done. I've, I've done a lot of analysis on this deal. We're within a couple hundred grand. And when you're talking, you know, 10 plus 11 plus million dollar deals, that's, that's within the ballpark. So at that point is when I felt comfortable reaching out to this group and say, hey, I've got a deal. So I submitted my deal to them at that point. But yeah, like you said, definitely a ton of due diligence and an anal you know, analyzing before bringing a deal to a sponsor. Yeah, and the other thing too is verifying. I imagine you didn't take all of their pro forma from, uh, from the broker as uh, you know, as as word right of what's truth. You know, so it's you reached out to property managers. That's very important because I've we've passed on deals before because we're like, no, that management's not correct, and the broker come back. Well, you know, I found one guy that operates operates out of a trailer here that can manage. Well, <laughs> I, you know, I I'm not giving you know. So it's like you know, I want to find and I want to talk to people. And make sure that's that's the thing about once you're into a market, you know, you know that market from doing research on it without even closing a deal. You know what market is for rents, mm -hmm. for a 1980s product, for a 2010 product. Um, you know what management is for that area. Um, you know all this stuff, and that makes you very educated. So it's that's awesome. Um, I, I imagine there's a bunch of mistakes, but give me a couple of mistakes that you think you made during the process or you did make during the process, whether it's. Uh, in this due diligence phase of it, or whether it was when you guys were working with the firm, the private equity firm, you guys are actually closing it. Yeah, regarding mistakes, you know, it was a really clean process and we didn't miss anything in our due diligence. Um, you know, one thing, I don't know if you'll say it's a mistake. I, I can't think of a mistake off the top of my head regarding underwriting. Um, but one thing to keep in mind when bringing a deal to a sponsor is it's great. I have benefited greatly from doing it. The thing is a lot of times with sponsors, what'll happen is they're out there willing to accept a deal from anybody who can find it, but they have their team in place. So you're bringing a deal to a team. They're going to go and do the next deal and they're not necessarily going to include you in that, in that deal. So you're not really a part of that team. Um, which can be, you know, like when I first got into it, bringing a deal, I was like, oh, great, I'm in with this great team, which I am on that deal, but not moving forward. So when you're doing that, like where I'm at today now, I have a team where we're looking, actively looking for deals, we're doing deals, we're raising money, and we're growing together. And that's really important for the next step if, you're, if you are just going to find a deal to bring to a sponsor. That's going to be the really big key to, to um 
scaling this business is having a great team in place that you can do deals with moving forward. So not a mistake, um, but just something to keep in mind when, when thinking about bringing a deal to a sponsor. Um, but yeah, as far as mistakes, I, I, we didn't make any during due diligence. We covered all our bases. So yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. That's fantastic. That's a great point you've made because I mean, we partner with other operators and uh, when we're doing deals and, um, you know, obviously we have like a, uh, they can do their own deals. We can do our own deals. We're not, you know, talking to them. Hey, we have this deal if we want to partner on it, but uh, you'll get emails and you'll say, Hey, we have a deal. that's already in underwriting, blah, blah, blah. Are you interested in partnering with us? Uh, a, B and C is what we need. And, uh, Hey, we're having a call this time and you're on the team per se. Um, I kind of like that as well, because then there's some deals I don't really want to do. I don't think they maybe have the experience. Right. Um, we have our investors money and our money tied up in other deals or whatever the situation is. There's tons of situation. But the thing is, that's a nice way. But just that you're involved and obviously you bring a deal to them. They're definitely going to return your call. They're definitely putting you on their email list when you have deals coming out. So that's what all. I mean, you have a fantastic and now you have great for your resume, but you also have a fantastic relationship out of it. So it's definitely a win win. And that's great business for everybody that's involved. Absolutely. That's one of the great things about this is, you know, you don't have to get married with a partner for the next 30 years with your business. You can each each building's its own business in a way. So you can do one deal. And then, you know, if, if things aren't working out as a partnership, well, hey, you're not you're not stuck together for the next 30 years and you're not, you know, 50 50 on one company on your overall company. Now you can go and do another deal with a different partner. Or if you guys are getting along, hey, you guys can partner on the next deal. So yeah. there's a lot of a lot of great benefits to syndication. So have you made any changes to your underwriting or property sourcing since purchasing the property? You know, we I'm not sure if we change it. One thing we we're look we're doing now is we're trying to be even more conservative after COVID mm -hmm. yeah. um, with our underwriting and our reserves. You know, COVID did hit us, especially the market that we're in. Um, so we're just keeping that in the back of our minds now. You know, obviously we don't expect another pandemic to hit. Those are those don't hit every every other year, but we are more conservative in our underwriting. We just don't know where things are going. Um, so just more conservative on the reserves. Um, is really kind of where we're at with our underwriting, just being yeah. more conservative. Nice. So yeah. what mistakes do you commonly see other real estate investors make? Yeah. You know, I would love to talk to some of these people that are buying properties at full price. You know, I, I put a bid in at a property. I'm like, this is a great deal. This is a great offer. And then the next guy will come in and offer twice as much as I offered. So I love to talk. I, I'm thinking those are probably mistakes. So when that deal I was telling you about that we bought, it was part of a portfolio, right? And I looked at each one separately. I said, this one works, this one doesn't. Well, the other one did work, obviously, but at our price, but not at their asking. They found somebody that was willing to get, willing to buy it at their asking. And I was like, how the hell did he, are they able to do that? And well, guess what? I got the other day an email. Hey, this property is now for sale. <laughs> <laughs> literally that one probably I couldn't believe it. I was like, wait a second. Is that the one? So, you know, I don't know what mistakes they made, but they clearly, in my opinion, they probably overpaid for it. Just like a lot of people are probably doing right now. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah well, I don't, they, they, people yeah. aren't being conservative with, with their numbers. People are willing to pay full retail, mm -hmm. retail price. Um, you know, when we're in the private equity business, we got to create equity in these deals. And when you pay, full price for them. It's hard to create, you know, I, I get these deals. Oh, value add, huge value add deal. But then they're asking more than the average sale price per unit in that market. So I'm like, that's not really a value add because even when you add, you know, raise the NOI, your exit is going to be at what you bought is going to be yeah. what you bought it for. So it doesn't really make sense. I, I don't know what, how people are doing this. It's going to be interesting to see how they, how it goes. Yeah, it's something I'm seeing too. And, uh, you know, I have people reach out to me in all different size properties just asking because of the show and everything. And someone reached out to me and said they were paying uh, $50,000 more or they're uh, pondering paying $50,000 over the appraisal on the property for this, uh, I guess, like single or duplex rental. And I'm like, well, the, I mean, you're not going to get financing if the appraisals come in at well, this. Right. <laughs> so you're going to put $50,000 up. I mean, and they want to get compensated for appreciation that's never even happened. It's the same thing when you have these brokers and they get the deal by saying, oh yeah, no, it's worth 110 a unit. 
but uh, it's going to be worth 140 afterwards. So we'll just we'll just cut them. We'll cut it right in the middle. And you're yeah. like, well, you there's no you you've, you're just adding on a premium for something that's never even happened, right? Yeah. Um, that you did know. So it's like it's so it's weird because we go into best and final, and uh, we haven't bought stuff in a few months here, mm -hmm. and it's something like. Uh, I mean, you know, they're like, oh, you're not going to win this. You know what I mean? Talking to brokers and you go back and forth and you're just like, how? And I look, I'm like, it's kind of, it's it's a little bit up there too, what we're offering. You know what I mean? It's not like we're getting yeah. a great, you know, but then I look at it and I'm like, how is someone overpaying this? You know, because we can make it work. We'll get long-term debt, all this kind of stuff, really yeah. minimize your downside. But a lot of people going out there, I don't think they know, but I also don't think they've really spoken to their lenders. And that's probably what happens with a lot of these deals where the broker circles up with, circles back with you and says, hey, like, you know, this is before sale. Well, what happened? Well, the price that they put, you know, they didn't tell you that, but it's like they didn't get financing, right? Or they'd have to come in with a, not a 25% down payment, they'd have to come in with a 35% down payment or something, which kills any kind of re return on that property. And um, yeah, it's it's interesting what's happening right now. That's for sure. Right, right. Yeah, so, it's, it's crazy. I, I had a deal sent to me the other day. It's a couple miles away from our current property. And I go, oh, this is interesting. You know, this could work. And then, you know, what, what are you guys hoping a door? And they said, they said 70 a door. And I said, that's what we're planning on exiting at at our current property in like three, four years after we still do all this work to it. Plus the property you just sent me is at 40% vacancy. So I'm like, wow. what are you guys? I looked at it, I'm at 30 a door. So I'm like, next, you know, obviously, but just, just the way it is out there. I don't know. I'm ready to buy a thousand units today, but if they make sense, you know, but yeah, just got to find that right deal. Yeah, for sure. And they're out there. I mean, it just takes yeah. time. And there's right. also you, I think um, a misconception too, if people have gone through a lot of coaching programs is there's only one way. Mm -hmm. And I feel that when you're researching highly successful, large private equity firms, you'll see that, um, you know, they're buying all different types of real estate asset classes. So they'll be buying industrial, they'll be buying single family. Obviously, it's easier to buy a 100 unit complex versus 100 single family houses. But if there's no deal there, if there's no possibility of getting a return, they can't do that, right? So now they're editing their approach to fit the market in that portion of the market cycle. So that's another thing too, that uh, we're always thinking outside the box, seeing how we can generate returns by going into, uh, you know, you're looking at stuff now, and especially when you're looking at properties now that are 40 years old, and uh, it's, you're like, well, I can build this for cheaper than this person selling it brand new. Right. And this is stuff too, that's a whole different, you know, a, a different thing from just acquiring multifamily, but it's, uh, you know, different uh, routes to getting to uh, generating returns. But mm -hmm. yeah. So what do you think are the main factors that have contributed to your success? You know, looking back at that 18 months. So like I said, 18 months to find the deal. You know, and this is, I have a full-time job. This is after work going home when all I want to really do is sit on the couch and watch TV, but I'm going home. I, I got rid of the TV. I put it in office in my living room and I just, I just was analyzing deals. I didn't give up. That's the big thing. That's what I'm trying to get at. I got close to a few, a uh, couple of deals um, during that 18 months and then we lost them, which was tough. So, you know, I, but I didn't quit. So not quitting, not giving up, just, just, I really had faith and belief that if I put in the time and the grind that I could find some success in this, in this industry, because there's so much great content out there that has, that just keeps telling me and that this is, you know, possible look, and they prove it. And I'm like, okay, I just got to keep doing it. So not giving up on it. And then that's really what led me to, to getting this deal. And again, I'm in that, I feel like I'm in that phase where I can't give up because now that I've, I have done that deal, I've house hacked this fourplex I'm in. Um, and it, I have, you know, it has been a while since I've, I found a good deal to syndicate and, you know, it, it's, it's starting, the trail's starting to go cold, but I'm not giving up. I, I'm, I just uh, had a talk with a, with a guy who owns a property down in Tallahassee, Florida today. He's interested in selling. He's going to give me the financials. We got that LOI out there um, submitted last week at a full asking price. Talked to the talk to the uh, seller today or yesterday. Said they're not ready to sign it, but um, it's because they're looking for um, a property to ten thirty one into. So they want to make sure they have they're ready for that. But to follow up next week, so we're hopeful nice. on that one. Yeah, so we're still hopeful on that. That's a two hundred unit, five miles away from our current property. Um, 
So, you know, I'm still not giving up, you know, even though we've had this long cold streak. So just don't give up, just keep going for it. And eventually you'll find something. Yeah, I totally agree with that because we've had a uh, similar here. It's not been as many acquisitions as we typically do. Right. And it's just, uh, but, you know, you got to stay and stick with what your returns are and um, make sure you're not getting into uncharted waters with uh, what other people are buying or what other people think they're going to be buying at. So uh, awesome. Awesome. So how can our listeners learn more about you and your business, Anthony? Yeah, appreciate that. So my website is financialbedrock.com. Actually just launched that. And I have, um, like I said, a free sample deal package for download on there right now. So you can go to my, go to the website, financialbedrock.com, download the free sample deal to see what it looks like. Um, see what the returns look like on the deals we do. But um, also my email is anthony at financialbedrock.com. So feel free to shoot me an email. Like I said, somebody emailed me the other day and we got to talk and they had a deal and now we just made an LOI with them on it. So you never know, nice. but yeah, reach out to me. I'm glad to hop on the phone and talk. Well, thanks Anthony for coming on. I will add those links into the show notes and I want to thank you so much for coming on. Charles, I really appreciate being on your show and it's an honor. So thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. You as well. Bye-bye. Hi, guys. It's Charles from the Global Investors Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're interested in getting involved with real estate, but you don't know where to begin, set up a free 30-minute strategy call with me at Schedule Charles. Thank you for listening to the Global Investor Podcast. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get new weekly episodes. For more resources and to receive our newsletter, please visit globalinvestorpodcast.com. And don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Nothing in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure, subscription documentation, and are subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Syndication Superstars, LLC, exclusively.